Okay, so well, first of all, thank you very much and thank you for all these uh, fruitful and very exciting conversations we're having today. Uh, I'm very happy to share with you this research um, I did about fat veganism in Spain and Latin America and what insights fat activists are bringing to, to understanding uh, body liberation beyond species. Okay, let's take. Okay, uh, so to start, uh, this is more or less the index of what I'm going to talk about. I hope I will do everything on time. If not, please let me know. Um, so I will uh, briefly introduce the research, uh, some key concepts and context, uh, share some results, and also discuss a little bit the, the results. And of course, I will include some cute photos of non-human animals considered fat <laughs> in our society. So it's gonna be easier. Okay. Okay. Uh, I would like to say uh, first that the whole research I'm going to talk about today is published already as a chapter in this amazing book, uh, Feminist Animal Studies, uh, edited by Erika Kutworth, who, who is here, and also Rook uh, Mackay and Dieter Ghost. Um, I'm very excited to be part of the of this amazing volume. So I encourage you everybody to to read it. Um, I also uh, start the chapter by kind of underlying the situated knowledge from where I write. So um, I'm a researcher, but I'm also a, an activist, and I've been involved in fat activism here in, in Spain, and also in animal liberation activism. And I must confess, I'm an anthropologist and not a sociologist in this conference as well as a sort of situated knowledge exercise. So, well, uh, what I examine is um, some different uh, works, different texts and pictures uh, that are part of book excerpts, blog posts, uh, fat scenes and conferences that happened uh, especially in Spain and Latin America. And um, I, I analyzed the discourse of these pieces uh, that were produced by fat activists uh, and the, I mean, the the most important aspect that I was interested in uh, was that non-human animals, anti-speciesism, and also veganism were explicitly mentioned. And the goal uh, of the research uh, was to explore how grassroots fat activisms uh, have, inter have integrated the animal liberation into their own emancipatory struggle, our own emancipatory struggle, because I have participated is in some of them as well. So um, some concepts, some important concepts of the um, of the research are the fat phobia, which I guess the majority of you already know, but it is, or it could be defined as the oppression uh, that affects fat people uh, because of not conforming to to normal no, normative uh, body patterns, uh, and fat phobia. I, I like very much uh, the philosopher Magdalena Pinheiro underlines uh, the fat phobic tripartite and she talks about the three pillars of fat phobia and that are aesthetics, uh, health and moral in the, sense, in the sense that fat bodies are, con are considered ugly and like generating, generating disgust uh, as well as not healthy as well as uh, are judged in moral terms as uncontrolled, uncivilized, and so on. So I think that these three pillars can uh, let us think a little bit more about how this fat phobia permeates uh, all the spheres of, of fat people's lives. Um, and of course, we also need to, to think about healthism that uh, could be defined as uh, the idea, the ideology that um, Everybody has the old individual uh, power to become healthy, but also that one has the moral duty to uh, be healthy, right? And, and that is also quite connected with the health industrial complex and the capitalist interest uh, that shape our bodies and, and how we should uh, be and which industries are benefiting from, from that messages, of course. And as a linked concept is also diet culture, that uh, refers as well to this idea that uh, diet is the salvation of uh, like non-conforming bodies, uh, in this case, uh, fat bodies. 
And for instance, if we see the, the photographs, we can uh, kind of understand what, what I mean with healthism. That is the idea that you are what you eat. Uh, it only depends on you and not on a whole systemic uh, model and, uh, and a structural characters, uh, environmental, economical, and so on. Uh, or the before after kind of narrative, as we can see here in this example, using veganism as well of this couple, uh, becoming thing after becoming vegan. Uh, and well, and we also have some infographics about how to fight diet culture, but just uh, as a as a idea of, of what I mean with these concepts. I also use the concept of anthropaki from Erika Goodworth, which I find very interesting to understand how these uh, patriarchal worldviews and body pressures can be also, well, are in fact indeed also connected with the domination of the earth and other animals. And also the concept of animalization, which is very common in, in decolonial literature. And the concept of thomorphism that Cory Green also used, um, which is if we see the, the PETA ad, we can kind of uh, understand what it means, right? Uh, the idea that fat bodies are more animal-like and also considering animal as something uh, bad. For instance, in this case, if when they say you are what you eat, they mean you are a pig and also they understand therefore that being a pig is something wrong which of course we don't, I think the majority of us don't think it is. Um, then I also need to contextualize that the um, groups I'm looking at are from Spain and Latin America. And I think it's difficult to, to separate uh, in the case of fat activism, the Spanish and the Latin American one, because they became uh, together from the start, I would say, not only because they shared a photosphere in the sense of this virtual space where uh, the politicization of, of the body and the fat body became like a tool, but also um, as Lucrecia Mason argues, because in the fat uh, liberation movement, we have like a genealogy other in the sense that the flows of influence are uh, contrary to the hegemonic flows. Uh, they come from um, South, global South to global North in the case of Latin America and Spain. So the majority or the first uh, activists and works um, were uh, born in Latin America or by uh, Latin American immigrants in Spain. So that's quite interesting as well. And also this grassroots movement that I'm examining uh, also share a radical core and an intersectional sensitivities against all forms of oppression, including sexism, transphobia, ableism, uh, class classicism, capitalism, and so on. Uh, some of the results here, you can see uh, an illustration from a fan scene I have examined. Uh, the, the fan scene is called Jauria. And well, in, in all the discourses and the productions, uh, I detected that fat activists were referring to the binary thinking and obviously questioning it. Uh, the idea of uh, human animals as separated uh, entities or female, male or nature, culture, and so on. And activists were also emphasizing interconnection and interdependence, following the ecofeminist tradition and the feminist care tradition as well. Um, another important fi uh, finding was that fat activists, at least these grassroots and more radical fat activists, were reclaiming animal insults. Instead of saying, no, I'm not fat, or no, I'm not a whale or a cow, uh, I'm a human, you know, and reclaiming the, the human part where the, where the power is, uh, they decided, we decided to uh, say, it's okay, yeah, we're that. I mean, that, that was used as an insult, but that's not an insult. And that can be part of, of our struggle as well, and of our uh, political discourse as well. Uh, also, the, the idea of an embodied para veganism uh, raises questions about the... Um, the equation of veganism with diet and all that has to do with diet culture and thinness and healthy fitness and so on, that is quite popular uh, in the capitalist frame, frameworks of veganism as well. And also um, from having experienced uh, structural oppression that arise a critical and solidary fat liberation. The idea that fat liberation must include, it includes not only human, 
uh, subjects and human struggles, but also uh, animal liberation. So uh, some discussions around this issue um, is that the fact that considering the interconnection between speciesism and fat phobia can challenge the hegemonic understandings we have of these forms of oppression, of both of them. Uh, in that sense, fat veganism is opposed to the corporate or lifestyle veganism, as Richard White would, would name it. Um, and also, uh, as I mentioned before, the Latin American and Spanish fat activist voices embrace the non-human animal, the approach that has been influenced by the decolonial critique um, to kind of uh, embrace the animalization, embrace the non-human animal instead of trying to distance uh, oneself from, from them. And also fat grassroots uh, activists offer particular and situated interaction of fat phobia and animal oppression uh, by incorporating what is always present in their lives, that is fat phobia and, and oppression. Uh, and that is similar to the co-sisters uh, argue for, for black people. So uh, when we take into account our oppression or, or our experience of oppression, sorry, uh, we can create new ways of understanding uh, these oppressions as well. And here I, I choose a classic example of the PETA campaign, uh, Save the Whales, and also an activist answered. This is more in the Anglo sphere, but still I think it's quite uh, visual and, and meaning, interesting, sorry. Yeah, here, and another example, uh, this one uh, appears in a fan scene and is the body, vegan body, right? Like uh, as if this was the only vegan body possible. Um, okay, and to sum up, uh, the I, what I think is more interesting from the analysis is the notion of critical emancipation. And here you can kind of see that spirit in the illustration from the uh, fat vegan artivist Artema Batze. And that is that um, fat activists are, are advocating for a more inclusive veganism, that is a veganism that is more than a diet and, and a veganism where all sizes and all bodies fit. And also they are, and we are advocating for an interspecies caring fat activism. That means um, that non-human animals can be also and should be also considered as individuals who are oppressed by bodily control and, and exploitation. So that would be all for the moment. <laughs> I hope you, you enjoyed the presentation. And of course, if you want to read the chapter, you can let me know and I will happily share it with you. Thank you. Uh, Melda from Open University, maybe some of them uh, recognize her. Uh, she will help with the pages and questions and answers uh, sections. I have some problems with English, but I will fix them. I hope so. <laughs> Okay, can you see? Okay. Hello everyone, thank you for joining. I'm Vahide Yasemin Özkoral, PhD student in sociology and from Turkey. Today I will share a part of my master thesis with you. Um, social relations and identity intersections of individuals adopting vegan ethical behavior. Firstly, uh, why did I do such a research? To focus on the changing social relations and reactions from the social environment with uh, the adoption of uh, vegan ethical behavior. To focus on the relationship of vegan identity with ascribed gender and to investigate its intersection with other social moments. And to investigate the relationship between vegan identity and religion. I adapted the interpretive paradigm and qualitative research method in my research as a vegetarian and almost vegan researcher myself. Uh, interpretative phenomenology was an inevitable method for me. I conducted my interviews with Turkish participants with using online interview technique. I carried at uh, the analysis of the research using Mexicuda software program and created categories and codes during coding. Uh, the discourses coming from the social environment and highly ethical on individuals who adapt a vegan ethical attitude 
the fact that discourse practices towards vegan ethical attitudes are superior, exclusionary, and marginalizing structures causes uh, negative effects on individuals' adoption, uh, maintenance, or perception of vegan ethical attitudes. Um, when the model is analyzed, it is noteworthy that the most common discourses is are that veganism, veganism is unhealth, that is may cause protein deficiency, the individuals uh, are emotional, and that it intersects with women's identity. Another discourse that emphasizes the female identity with discourses is men uh, eat meat, which uh, causes the conception of animal products to be accepted as masculine and veganism to be identified with women. A male par uh, participants state the following. They made approaches like you'll quit anyway, you'll go back to eating meat or something like you are doing it to attract attention, you must be eating it secretly. Uh, they didn't believe it. They definitely didn't believe it because they thought it, I was joking because I, I, uh, it didn't mean being more masculine to them. The relationship between attributed gender and vegan ethical attitudes. The fact that behaviors, colors, occupations, daily life practices, ethical attitudes uh, preferences, in other words, everything in daily life is determined according to the attributed gender has a great impact on individuals. And discourses coming from the social environment show that uh, there is a relationship between the accepted norms uh, that societies attribute to male and female genders and veganism. The fact that consuming animal products is considered masculine, the idea that vegan ethical attitude is caused by sensitivity and emotionality. Vegan ethical attitude is seen as feminine by the society. Uh, the fact that individuals whose ascribed gender is male are distant to the ethical attitude of vegan ethics in society with the idea that um, it is feminine and that consuming non-human animals is seen as Masculine in society shows the influence of kindism and culture on individuals. Participants also make the following statements regarding uh, the masculinized situation. Um, most men have something called prosine. That is, they are decided for support. It is necessary to consume meat. It is necessary to consume protein powders, but this is changing in the younger generation because I have a few male clients. Um, when we look at the relationship between vegan identity and religion, while, uh, while four participants say that they do not adopt any religions, re religious belief, uh, two participants say that they are this days. Some of participants stated that they would not be vegan if uh, they had religious beliefs that uh, there is a dichotomy between religious beliefs and veganism. Um, because religion emphasizes human superiority and supports the idea that animals exist for humans. The fact that uh, human superiority comes to the for in beliefs and the idea that animals exist for humans is emphasized in belief system are among the points mentioned by participants regarding beliefs categories. Vegan, eti vegan ethical attitude and social relations. And the fact that individuals with vegan Ethical attitudes are in the minority group in society uh, causes some change in their social relations. The fact that social relations are based on culture and social norms and that individuals are raised by adapting uh, these norms from the moment they are born into uh, society ensures the continuation of past narratives and social norms. In other words, individuals are born into the carnist order. It was stated by the participants that the 
opposition uh, of individuals with vegan ethical attitudes towards uh, the norms, culture, and carnist beliefs of the society caused them to, to be stigmatized. Participant to express this briefly as follows. I mean, most of the time, I don't say I'm vegan because they put an automatic label. You are vegan, so you must be like this. Unfortunately, it will be a bit difficult to change that perspective. As for the intersection of vegan ethical behavior with other social moments, when the statements of the participants Regarding the intersection of identities are analyzed, it is emphasized uh, that each moment basically includes equality, justice, respect, and opposition to the mechanism of domination. Therefore, social moment identities are intersectional. Although the participants state that the idea of intersectionality and equality for all is present in each moment. They stated that the intersection of the vegan movement with other social movements causes veganism to gain a negative place in society. They state that the emphasis of each moment on the fight it is based on becomes ambiguous um, due to intersectionality of the movements. Lastly, I will touch on the emotional state. Um, I did not directly touch upon the emotional state in my interviews, but the uh, commonality of the participants' emotional states made it necessary to handle the emotional state as a separate topic. The marginalization and stigmatization of individuals with vegan ethical attitudes in society um, caused them to feel lonely, embrace it and hide the fact that they adopt a vegan ethical attitude. Some of the uh, individuals who, who came together in a stigmatization category uh, used terms such as group, V or R in their def definitions and revealed that they felt belonging to that group in this way. It is seen that vegan individuals also create login within themselves with the concept of V. The most emphasized point of the participant was that uh, they felt lonely. And thinking that they are doing the right thing, being proud is the ethical attitude expressed and adopted uh, by participants in terms of ethics, health, ecology, etc. They think that they take responsibility for the environment, animals, and helped by making the right choice. Uh, during the research process, it was noted that vegan individuals state the importance of their emotional states and thought that there was an intersectionality between belief systems and vegan attitudes. Um, in the research, the issues of mood and belief system were included in the main outlines. However, the intersectionality between these topics and veganism can be analyzed in more detail and in depth in other studies. Okay, thank you for listening. And reminder, Melda from will help with the pages and question and answer section. Thank you. Can you see it at uh, full screen or just, uh, right, can you see it now? Yes, we can. Brilliant. So okay. hello everyone. Uh, my name is Elia Tai Bennett. I am a final year PhD student in sociology at the University of Southampton in the UK. I'm funded by the South Coast DTP and that is part of the ESRC. So my research explores the lived experiences of Muslim, Jewish and Christian vegans um, in the context of late modern Great Britain. Um, but the focus of my presentation today is instances of implicit racism and religious exploitation in vegan activism and vegan discourse, which results in feelings of alienation and exclusion among Jewish and Muslim vegans. So the theme of this conference is intersectionality. Um, and I don't really need to go into any great depth here as this whole weekend is about this and others have already covered it so beautifully. Um, but one intersection that has been widely studied and which is incredibly informative here 
is the intersection with race, and particularly that of black veganism, which Co and Co and Harper, and more recently Adewale as well, have explored in great depth. So we learn through black veganism that not only is the vegan experience of black vegans different to that of white vegans, but that numerous systemic issues are at play. Now, I risk oversimplifying here due to a lack of time, but essentially black veganism highlights the connections between races, racism and speciesism and is thus a political stand protesting against systemic racism, which animalizes black and ethnic minority groups, as well as protesting against Eurocentric hierarchy building, colonial practices, oppression, harm and underrepresentation. In turn, it seeks to assist in the decolonization of both veganism and one's own bodies, provide a much needed sense of belonging and give a voice to black vegans. As we, shall, as we shall see later in this presentation, there are numerous parallels between these points and the points I will make in relation to Jewish and Muslim vegans. Indeed, race is often a critical issue for many Jewish and Muslim individuals too, so there is a key overlap here. Now, where religion is concerned, there is a stark lack of empirical research that explores this intersection. There are studies that explore veganism in relation to religion, but they tend to be more theological or theoretical in nature. For example, exploring whether veganism is permissible under religious law, spoiler alert, it is, um, or how practical veganism is in accordance with religious ritual and practice, and arguments for the adoption of veganism for religious adherence. Of those studies that do take an empirical approach, there is considerable discussion around motivations. Uh, however, these are concentrated on South Asian religions, namely Jainism and Buddhism, and on anthropological studies exploring the African Hebrew Israelite community, which is a group of Jews separate from mainstream Judaism, for whom veganism is the default way of living. Further, there are a handful of studies that touch on religion and offer a brief insight into topics such as stigma and activism. But where religion is not the main focus, the insight is indeed brief. Thus, there is a need for empirical research on the intersection between veganism and religion. So a research gap emerges. What do the lived experiences of Jewish and Muslim vegans look like? We can learn about veganism within Ju Ju Judaism and some insights from Jewish vegans from Labentz and Yanklovitz's 2019 edited volume, Jewish Veganism and Vegetarianism. But a lack of empirical research remains. To my knowledge, no significant empirical study focusing solely on Muslim vegans exists, but we can gain some insights from other works, such as Olishuk et al's 2019 paper, which explored cultural repertoires surrounding meat eating in Canada, and incidentally recruited a few Muslim participants. Nevertheless, I emphasize again that there is a need for empirical research that will reveal what the lived experiences of Jewish and Muslim vegans look like. Now, before I start explaining my research topic, I want to briefly discuss a particularly pertinent paper by Claire Jean Kim entitled Moral Extensionism or Racist Exploitation, the Use of Holocaust and Slavery Analogies in the Animal Liberation Movement. This paper discusses two traveling exhi exhibits, both produced by PETA, that is People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. The first exhibit, which traveled to more than 70 US cities and nearly 20 countries between 2003 and 2005, was entitled The Holocaust on Your Plate and featured images and figures relating to the Holocaust. The second exhibit, which was launched in 2005, was entitled Animal Liberation Project, We Are All Animals. And this time juxtaposed images of animal suffering with images of the suffering of black slaves and other historically subordinated human groups. Both of these exhibits generated a considerable amount of controversy, particularly among Jewish and black leaders. In terms of studying this response, Kim analyzes the public responses by leaders in these communities, but we do not find out how individuals who are not leaders in the, um, perceive such discourse. More, but there's more on this later as my research does touch on this. But for now, I wish to read out a couple of short extracts from this paper, which offer a suggestion as to how these exhibits and the message they convey may be received by members of the Jewish and black communities. So the first one, an implicit subtext in Jewish and black expressions of outrage towards the Holocaust and slavery analogies is that their group struggle in fact goes on, that despite the triumphalist narratives of Jewish and black survival, Jews and blacks continue to fight for full membership in humankind. And secondly, 
Resistance has been especially strong to Peter's exhibits, which appear to many Jews and Blacks to be undermining their claims to full humanity by reawakening taboo historical associations with animals. So onto my research topic. So I am interested in the lived experiences of Muslim, Jewish and Christian vegans in the UK. I am interested in exploring what the intersection between veganism and religiosity looks like. How is veganism understood by vegans of faith? How one actually becomes a vegan of faith? What support both in a social and a learning sense is available to vegans of faith? And what negotiations take place, particularly considering how these three Abrahamic faiths do have traditions and rituals that appear at first to be very vegan unfriendly. Oops. To gather data for this research project, I recruited 36 vegans of faith in the UK, so 12 Muslim participants, 12 Jewish participants and 12 Christian participants, but this presentation looks at only 24 of them, so the Jewish and the Muslim participants. I conducted a series of interviews, WhatsApp diary groups that captured both everyday living and some key religious festivals, and also virtual participant observation, which was basically video calls where participants either gave me a tour of their kitchen or a cooking demonstration. In terms of my own positionality, I regard myself a vegan of faith, having been raised Christian before later becoming a Muslim, so I have a good understanding of how religion and veganism come together. So turning now to the focus of this presentation, which is feelings of exclusion and alienation among Jewish and Muslim vegans in response to implicit racism and relig religious exploitation in vegan activism and discourse. I never asked questions relating to racism or anti-Semitism specifically, but several Jewish participants did refer to analogies between factory farming and the Holocaust and how it made them feel. I'll read a couple of quotes. Leah said, one expression often used by vegan activists that disgusts me and pushes me away is the use of the term Holocaust to apply to the killing of animals for food. There is only one Holocaust. It is both deeply offensive and, in my view, destructively undermining of the animal rights cause to conflate the two. While Meyer explained, there's only so many times you can see people comparing factory farming to the Holocaust before you're like, no, no. For this reason and others, many of my Jewish vegan participants kept away from what they perceived to be secular vegan communities due to these instances of racist exploitation, moral extensionism, and in their view, anti-Semitism. Such comments that were thoughtlessly shared on online vegan groups, and as we saw earlier in animal activism as well, left Jewish vegans feeling alienated and excluded. Such spaces were thus not safe spaces. Among Muslim vegans, meanwhile, instances of Islamophobia in vegan discussion forums and within vegan activism groups were also reported. Layla explained, I've seen that there's a lot of, you know, activists like British ones and the American ones that kind of use Islam as like a way to be like, this is cruel. People that use like halal as an excuse to bring people to veganism, I would say that's wrong because you're picking one religion and using that. And then that's also Islamophobic as well. Zainab added, there's been this whole thing of halal meat and we're put in a very difficult position where we agree with some of the arguments of production and things like that, but the Islamophobia that is tied with these arguments is just like, no, we're not on board with that. Zainab had also witnessed many racist posts from vegans in vegan forums. She says they would post about the sacrifices of Eid and people would say things like, oh, I want my religion tells me to go to Pakistan and slaughter a load of Muslims. Whilst the latter point hopefully only relates to a very small group of Islamophobic individuals, the exploitation of the halal industry and Eid sacrifice in vegan activism to portray Islamic practices as especially cruel becomes a form of Islamophobia, which once again alienates and excludes Muslim vegans from broader vegan spaces and renders them unsafe for such individuals. Such exploitation of the Holocaust and Islamic practices then can be understood to be a barrier to effective activism, as this kind of discourse generates feelings of alienation and exclusion among these individuals. Moreover, it is also constituted as a barrier to belonging and meant that many vegans of faith did not feel comfortable in spaces that were insufficiently mindful of intersectionality and others' experiences. Zainab explained that she had been a member of online secular vegan groups, but that, and I quote, I wanted specifically a vegan community that wasn't centered around whiteness, if that makes sense, you know, and centered around almost like some often middle class narratives and particular narratives that completely ignore intersectionality. For this reason, she left the secular vegan communities that she had been a part of. 
My first finding then is that large scale organised vegan activism and indeed vegan communities and spaces more broadly are not always perceived to be safe spaces for Jewish and Muslim vegans. Hannah said, too many vegans in one place get pushy and scary. Elijah spoke of secular vegan get togethers. I don't know if I would really feel like I belong there. And Shira talking about vegan activism said, I find it quite judgmental and I find some of the language that vegan activists use quite inappropriate. We learn through black veganism and also in Kim's paper that the more mainstream white secular vegan discourse is not always mindful of systemic issues and as such often actually perpetuate the harm caused by them. Think racism, animality, lack of belonging, whiteness and white privilege, underrepresentation and so on. Black vegan writers apply this in a racial sense, but the same appears true within a religious and cultural context too. So what do these vegans of faith do then in the absence of safe vegan spaces where they feel that they can belong? My second finding is that vegans of faith form their own faith vegan identity. Maya explains, I'm definitely part of like a hyper specific like Jewish vegan niche because it influences the way that we talk about Judaism. Whilst Alia told me, I would probably say the Muslim veganism is what I kind of follow. Thus, vegans of faith are carving out their own vegan identity, which they combine with their faith identity. Through this new faith vegan identity, they share a mutual understanding with others who also adopt such an identity. But one thing worth mentioning at this point is that um, the, the, the values and the ethics that are underpinning this identity is still very much in line with those vegan ethics and are not at all anthropocentric or oppressive like many people um, perceive religion to be. Um, so in this way, they slightly differentiate themselves from what could be called a secular veganism. I appreciate I'm generalizing here. But what they do is they infuse their veganism with both faith, cult, faith and culture and create a nuanced form which is mindful of intersectionality which does provide a sense of safety and belonging, and which is specific and sympathetic to their experiences and understandings. Linked to this, we also witness the emergence of faith vegan communities, which are vegan communities centered upon religious identity. And this is my third key finding. These communities benefit from a mutual understanding, shared concerns and shared social norms. Other studies have suggested that vegan groups provide, and I quote Williams et al, a sense of belonging, affiliation and support, so alleviating feelings of segregation. However, in many of my participants' experiences, vegan groups centred upon this whiteness perpetuated segregation and created a barrier to belonging and support. Faith vegan communities in comparison provided a much needed source of support and eradicated any feelings of alienation and exclusion that may have arisen previously. Jacob described the Jewish Vegetarian Society, which I quote him as being vegan in all but name, as a grouping of like-minded people. Whilst Farah described the Facebook group Vegan Muslim Community saying, I love that place. They make me feel like a properly sane human being. That's for more moral support because I think you get cross-examined a lot as a Muslim vegan. For Jewish and Muslim vegans then, seeking a vegan community centered upon their faith identity became important for support and belonging and provided an avenue for representation and expression, much like what black vegans have sought to do in their spaces and activities. My final finding was that the participants in my study were quite critical of certain forms of organized vegan activism, which they perceived to be secular and implicitly white. We saw a quote from Shira earlier where she described it as judgmental and as using inappropriate languages, but other participants used even stronger words than that. As such, very few participants engaged in organised vegan activism. However, many participants did still want to spread the vegan message. What was interesting was they demonstrated a desire to engage in a form of vegan activism, but only within their faith communities, not outside of them. So again, we witnessed the merging of veganism and faith through activist activities, and also to aid in the formation of those faith vegan communities. Nadia, who engages in social media activism, explained the food Instagram that I have, that's kind of where I post pictures and just kind of like join the vegan faith community. Whilst Elijah shares information about veganism and Judaism on his Facebook, but also in everyday conversations, he said, I'll share words of Torah, like religious teachings, and I'll kind of plug veganism a bit in there. Vegans of faith thus perform vegan activism differently by choosing specific spaces and a specific audience, both of which are centered upon faith. And in their activism activi activities, they are mindful of religious, religious experience and belief. 
Unlike black veganism, though, which seeks in part to decolonize veganism and protest against systemic racism, animality and colonialism, there was little indication within my sample of a desire to challenge the implicit racism and religious exploitation evident in some vegan spaces and discourse. Although my sample was small, so further study could reveal otherwise. But what my study did show instead was a breaking away, a separation from wider vegan groups and activism and the formation of specific faith vegan spaces and activities to counter the feelings of alienation and exclusion that were evoked. So the challenge for vegan activism and vegan communities more broadly is to be more mindful of intersectionality, of implicit racism and prejudice and discourse, of inclusivity, and ultimately to become a safer space for all vegans, regardless of background, belief or so on. So in conclusion, vegan activism is at times perceived as being insufficiently mindful of intersectionality. This is especially so when vegan activists exploit the Holocaust, the halal industry or the Eid sacrifice in their activism activities. Such racist and religious exploitation is perceived by Jewish and Muslim vegans as anti-Semitic and Islamophobic, and it creates a barrier to effective activism as it generates feelings of alienation and exclusion among Jewish and Muslim vegans. As such, secular vegan spaces and organized vegan activism are not always seen as safe for Jewish and Muslim vegans. In response, they often form their own faith vegan identity, seek out a faith vegan community, and if they want to get involved in activism, will do so within their own faith communities. Overall, we witness a separation between mainstream veganism and the experience of Jewish and Muslim vegans. I term the intersection between religion and veganism, faith veganism, which I talk about in my thesis. This separation is likely caused in part by implicit racism, religious exploitation and vegan activist discourse, as well as a lack of understanding and belonging between the groups. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Does anyone have any questions?